text from the book of Jeremiah, Jeremiah chapter number 1, verses 1 through 10. And uh, when you have it, say amen. If you need more time, say hold on. And if you need more time, it's on the screen. Amen. <laughs> the Bible says this, the words of Jeremiah, the son of Hilkiah, of the priests that were in Anathoth, in the land of Benjamin, will you read with me? Amen. To whom the word of the Lord came in the days of Josiah, the son of Ammon. Is it on the screen? Let's start over. Let's start over. Let's start from the top. Amen. The words of Jeremiah, the son of Hilkiah, of the priests that were in Anathoth, in the land of Benjamin, to whom the word of the Lord came in the days of Josiah, the son of Ammon, king of Judah, in the thirteenth year of his reign. It came also in the days of Jehoiakim, the son of Josiah, king of Judah, under the end of the eleventh year of Zedekiah, the son of Josiah, king of Judah, under the carrying away of Jerusalem, captive in the fifth month. Verse 4. Then the word of the Lord came unto me, saying, <laughs> Before I formed thee in the belly, I knew thee. And before thou camest forth out of the womb, I sanctified thee, and I ordained thee a prophet unto the nations. Then said I, Ah, Lord God, behold, I cannot speak, for I am a child. But the Lord said unto me, Say not, I am a child, for thou shalt go to all that I shall send thee, and whatsoever I command thee, thou shalt speak. Be not afraid of their faces, for I am with thee to deliver thee, saith the Lord. Then the Lord put forth his hand and touched my mouth, and the Lord said unto me, Behold, I have put my words in thy mouth. See, I have this day set thee over the nations and over the kingdoms to root out and to pull down and to destroy and to throw down, to build and to plant. I want to preach a message that I've entitled this morning, When Justice and Mercy Kiss. When Justice and Mercy Kiss. Let's make our prayer. Gracious Heavenly Father, we come before you. I just ask that you would uh, have your way in this place. Lord, I thank you that... At any moment, at any time of the day, your door is always open. There's always access to your throne for whatever it is that we have need of. Father, we just come before you and ask that you might have your way. In light of recent activities and events in our history, God, I pray that you would bless this nation. We lift this nation up before you. We pray for your healing. You said if my people who are called by your name should humble themselves, seek your face, and turn from their wicked ways, then you would hear from heaven and you would heal the land and you would forgive their sins. We see it in the life of the prophet Jonah, even in the belly of a whale. He directed himself toward the holy temple, and he prayed, and you released him from the belly of the whale. And so, Father, I pray that we would direct our attention to you right now in the name of Jesus, that we would lift up our eyes and look under the hills from whence cometh our help. Our help comes from you, that our trust would not be in chariots or horses, but it would be in the name of the Lord our God. For the name of the Lord our God is a strong tower, righteous running into it and are safe, Father God. You are the one who sets up kings and pulls down kingdoms. You are king over kings and lord over lords. So have your way in this house, have your way in this city, have your way in this nation, and God, we will bless your wonderful name. I pray over your people that you would open their ears that they might hear and their hearts that they might receive and that they might be challenged and moved, Father God, to do your will, to answer the call, to be the, the, the voice of justice and mercy in the land. And God, we will give you the glory, the honor, and the praise. And we pray in the name that is above every name, in the name that at the mention of it every knee should bow and tongue confess, in the name of your beloved Son, our beloved Savior, we pray these things in Jesus' name. And all of God's people said, Amen. 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 I want to I set the stage and just kind of bring you into the text so that you'll understand what is happening here in the life of Jeremiah. And I believe that you'll see some parallel to what is happening 
uh, in the world, in our present and modern day today. Um, the nation of Israel um, has gone through uh, persecution and challenges and trials and tribulations and difficulties in this season of, their, of, of the nation. And uh, the prophet Jonah was sent to go and preach to Nineveh. If you remember, God told him, hey, Jonah, I want you to go to Nineveh and I want you to preach to the city. Well, Nineveh was the capital city of Assyria, and Assyria was a sworn enemy of the, of the nation of Israel. In fact, they had, they had plundered, they had pillaged, they had so many issues, trials, and drama. But if you study the prophet Jonah, you understand that he was reading the prophecies of Joel, who was telling, God, telling the nation of Israel that God is going to raise up Nineveh, he's going to raise up Assyria, and he's going to use them to judge you for your sin. So when Jonah says, I'm not going to Nineveh, it is not just a sheer rebellion from God's word. It is because he knows that God is merciful and that God is going to, 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 to show mercy to Nineveh and ultimately use Nineveh to judge the nation of Israel. So it would be as if God told you to go to your sworn enemy and tell your sworn enemy the word of the Lord, and then they repent, and God heals, and God restores, and later uses them to come and judge your nation. He says, God, I ain't going. I'm going to Tarshish. And so God delivers him there. Well, Jeremiah is, is, is under the teachings of one of the other minor prophets, Hosea. And Hosea prophesied that Babylon is going to judge the nation of Israel. Babylon is going to make an ark, right? Babylon is modern-day Iraq, right? It is where they're going to make an ark, they're going to pass through Assyria, and they're going to overarch the, the, uh, the, the fertile crescent, Mesopotamia, and they're going to come down and they're going to descend upon Israel from the north, and they're going to be dogs at the gate, if you will, waiting for God to open the gates of Israel and allow them to come in and judge the nation. Jeremiah is raised up in a time prior to that invasion when God is trying to warn the nation of Israel that I am going to judge you if you don't repent of these things. Immorality, idolatry, and iniquity. Sound like America? They had brought on all of this idol worship. They had brought on all of this iniquity. In fact, they were so idolatrous that they were taking their children and they were giving their children to be sacrificed at the altar of Moloch. Sound like today? Right? And so let me help you understand something while this message is directed and, and, and inspired and, and pointed towards the youth. There is also a word in the, in the book, in the text, in the context for us as parents. Listen, the Bible says that children are in heritage of the Lord, and the fruit of the womb is his reward. God makes no mistake that in the opening of the text, he tells us who Jeremiah's father is and where he comes from. Parents, we have a mandate, we have a mission to raise our children in the nurture and in the admonition of the Lord. They are not your children. They are God's children loaned to you to raise as if you were in his stead raising those children. God is instructing us to do justice and to do mercy and to do equity, and it begins in our own house. There's, there's, listen, the, 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 the children, remember, Jeremiah is going to, he's going to declare when God calls him, he's going to disqualify himself by saying, I'm but a child. <laughs> Parents, stop disqualifying your children. <gasps> God doesn't need the elderly. God doesn't need the strong. God doesn't need the brilliant and the bright. And I'm going to talk about this in just a second when we talk about qualifications. God can use the mouths of babes to perfect praise. God can use young children to, 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 to move his mission forward. God can use you. And so I want you to tell your neighbor, neighbor, God can use you. No, say, say it like you mean it because 
because we have this tendency to disqualify ourselves because of our past, because of our heritage, because of our age, because of our lack of experience, because of our inabilities, because of our inefficiencies, because of our failures. We have this reason, this laundry list as to why we cannot do what it is that God has called us to do. And I'm submitting to you that God can use you. So tell your neighbor, God can use you. Jeremiah is from the city of Anathoth. It is a city which is north of the city of Jerusalem. It is a small town. God don't care that you are from a small town. Where, 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 the, where the two street lights in the town, you can see them when you enter. God doesn't care what city you're from. God doesn't care what family, what your lineage and your heritage is. God doesn't care how much money you have in your bank account. God doesn't care about the letters after your name. God doesn't care about your qualifications. God doesn't care about your experiences. God takes the foolish things and he confounds the wise. He takes the weak things and he confounds the strong. He takes the rich, th the poor things, and he confounds the rich. God takes broken things and does beautiful things with broken things and broken people. God can use you. He can use you. Young people, God can use you. God can use you, whether it's singing, whether it's serving, whether it's preaching, whether it's playing an instrument, whether it's a doctor or a lawyer or a business owner, an entrepreneur, God can use you. Yeah. And so the first thing I want you to write down if you take notes is this term, qualification. 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 In the text, I want you to, here's, here's the, the thought, the theme, the the thing I want you to get in your spirit. God doesn't call the qualified. He qualifies the called. David, when he is David, King David, when he is anointed to be king, he's not even invited in the house with his other brothers for the prophet Samuel to determine which of Jesse's sons is going to be king. Imagine that. You've got sons. And David doesn't even get an invitation into the house. In fact, when Samuel realizes that the sons who are present are not the anointed and chosen sons, he says, there must be another son. Because I know for sure that God told me that your son, one of your sons, would be the next king of Israel. And his father, uh, uh, Jesse, David's father says, Oh, you must be talking about, and in the, in, the, in the King James text, it uses the term, you must be talking about the youngest. But if you look in the Hebrew, he doesn't say youngest because, in fact, Jeremiah is going to use a similar term when he says, I'm a child. He says, I am a Nahar. When he talks about David, he says, David, he's, he's the youngest. He, he calls him, the, 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 the Hebrew word that he uses, it means the, the, most, the, the, the least significant. Not just the youngest, but the least significant. In fact, he calls him a, a hakatan. He's a hakatan. He, he's, he's, he's the most insignificant of all the bunch. He's the, he's the least of these. And, and, and it is that one that God picks. You remember Gideon? Gideon is by all intents and purposes a coward. He is someone who is hiding wheat from the Midianites. He's not out there on the battle fighting the enemy. He's hiding and he's threshing wheat as God comes to him and God says, thou mighty man. Yeah. Moses is on the backside of the desert and God comes to him and he calls him to lead the nation of Israel out of bondage in Egypt. And Moses' response is, I cannot do what you have called me to do because I have a st 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 stutter. I, I cannot st 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 speak before them. I have dyslexia. I have complications with my mouth. And God says, you have the ability because I'm going to put my hand on your mouth. I'm going to put my word in your mouth, your, my fire in your belly, and my hand at your back. So what you do is you go to Pharaoh and tell him, let my people go. Your qualifications are not the same qualifications that God has. Now, now listen, I'm not saying don't get education. I'm not saying don't go to school, right? Some of y'all young people are going to be like, my dad, pastor said, 
that uh, I don't have to go to school because because Jesus, Jesus, did, he don't care about my qualifications. Well, young people, Jesus says, honor thy mother and thy father, and thy days on the earth might be lit long, right? This is the first command with promise. So, so, you, so you go through the process, but what, what you understand is, is, is what's happening in the world, as Pastor Blow talked about last week, is, is there is a Babylon. There's a Babylon on the horizon. There, there, there's an enemy at the gate, and Jeremiah is coming in, and he's saying, if we turn to God... God will deal with our enemies in the same way he's dealt with them in the past. But if we don't, God's going to open up the doors. He's going to let the dogs come in, and they're going to overrun this nation. And you know, you, know what, you know what Israel does when in Jeremiah's prophecies? What happens, what he prophesied, happens. Babylon is a nation that has idolized war and wealth. Sound like the nation you're in? Right? There's an idolatry of war and wealth. And Babylon is consuming by, 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 by attack and by war, consuming neighboring nations. We destroyed Assyria. We destroyed Lebanon. We are here at your gates, and we are going to come in. And Jeremiah is the herald who is unqualified by man's standards, but qualified by God's standards to be the one to proclaim this message of hope, this message of justice, this message of mercy. In Israel, there was extreme injustice. In fact, if you study through the, the life of Jeremiah, for 20 years he preaches to the king Josiah. You see the layout of the kings that were there. Well, Josiah is one of the good kings who institutes or reinstitutes what they called the, Deut the, Deuteronom the Deuteronomical reforms. So he brings back the principles. If you go and you look in the book of Exodus and Deuteronomy, Deuteronomy is the book of the second law. So it is God re-giving the same law to the nation of Israel, and he's breaking things down. And the law, if you look at the Ten Commandments, people have this argument and this complex with the Ten Commandments. But here's what they really are summarized. The first five deal with our relationship between us and God. The second five deal with our relationship between us and man. So when it comes to God, have no other idols. God is the only wise God. He's the one who sits upon the circle of the earth. He's the one who parted the Red Seas. He's the one who brought Goliath to his knees. He's the one who has provided manna from heaven. He's the one who has healed and restored, renewed and revived. He's the one that's protected and upheld. Have no other gods before him. What in the world could there be a problem with having God as first in your life? Right? Thou shalt make no graven images of heaven. Because what happens is we take that which is transcendent and we try to put it on an earthly view and we minimize its holiness and we minimize it, right? We're in a fight right now. Is Jesus white? Is Jesus black? That's the white Jesus. This is the black Jesus, right? Because we are making graven images, right? And the images that we make are nothing more than an extension, an expression of ourselves. So if I'm a white person and I want to believe in a Jesus, I'm going to put forth a white Jesus. If I'm black, I'm going to put forth a black Jesus. If I'm Asian, I'm going to put forth an Asian Jesus. Because we're making those graven images, not in the image of God, not in the image of heaven, but in our own images. What's wrong with not having graven images? What's wrong with not murdering? Thou shalt not kill. What's wrong with that? What's wrong with thou shalt not lie? What, what's wrong with those things? Right? And so, so Josiah, he institutes the, 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 the Deuteronomical reforms to not only reestablish righteousness between God and man, but to deal with social injustice. Because the second half of the Ten Commandments relate to social injustice. It's not okay for you to kill your brother. It's not okay for you to covet what your brother or sister has. It's not okay to lie to your neighbor. It's not okay. What it does is it causes, has anybody ever been lied to? How did it feel when you got lied to? Did it feel good? When someone, right, you've ever been scammed before? I, I was scammed one time. I was scammed. I was scammed. I was scammed. But watch this. I had to be rebuked because... 
What, what allowed the scam to happen was, was, was me, was my proclivity, was something that was in my own life. And so I'm at the gas station, and this guy pulls up to me, and uh, he, he says, hey, can you give me some gas? And I'm like, yeah, sure, I'll give you some gas. He shows me his gas gauge. It's almost on E. And I'm like, okay, great, man, that's, you know, I'll give you some gas. And he said, hey, listen, my family and I were stranded here, and we're just trying to get back to our hometown, and uh, can, you, can you help us out? He says, man, I got some gold, man. I'll sell you my gold, and, uh, and, 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 and you give me the money, you take the gold, you can sell the gold or whatever. Now, listen, watch this. I've been in a, I work for a pawn shop. I've tested gold before. I know the owner of a pawn shop in Melbourne, the owner, the CEO, he owns the pawn shop. I know him. I know the, the employees of a local pawn shop here in Palm Bay. I can pick up the phone. Oh, hey, Josh, how's it going? Because I, you know, let me give you some help, money management 101. You don't have to pay retail for stuff. You can go down to the pawn shop and you can get it on the cheap, amen? It works just fine and it, and it does the trick, amen? And so, <laughs> and so, 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 so what, 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 what I, I know these people and, and, and I, I said, okay, let me drive them over to the bank and I withdraw money in exchange for this gold. And guess what, y'all? Gold was fake. Ask me how much I lost. Stop looking into things that don't concern you. <laughs> so y'all want to know my mess, but y'all don't want me to know your mess. <laughs> right? <laughs> right? And so... Their social, now watch this, what happened to me was an injustice. I, I got swindled. I was lied to. I was hoodwinked. I was bamboozled. <laughs> but here's what drove the, the action. I thought, I can get the gold and sell it for more than what I'm going to give him in cash. And there's my emergency fund. There's a little spending money. There's a little. That's happening in Israel. There is social injustice. Orphans are not being cared for. Widows are being taken advantage of. The, the, the least of these, are, are their, their cases are not being tried. Their, 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 their concerns are not being heard. And, and, the, and, the, and the wealthy and those in power are taking advantage of a system. And, 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 and it's not just the politicians, but it's also the religious crowd because Jeremiah is called to not only speak to the kings, but he's called to speak to the priests and he's called to speak to the people. There is mass injustice. There is mass iniquity. There, is, there are people sacrificing their children. And so God says, I don't need your qualifications. You're a young person. The young people, listen, you ever have a young person come and tell you something and what the response is? You know, you don't know nothing. You don't know what you're talking about. Just live a little bit longer. Do you even know what a telephone is, a rotary phone is? Do you even know? Right? And, and, and watch this. We, we have a young generation that looks at the old generation and says, you don't know what you're talking about. In fact, I know, what, I know where to find what I'm talking about. G-O-O-G-L-E dot com. Right? So God is, not, God is not hung up by your qualifications. He is not, he is not turned away. God is calling you. And so let me, let me kind of help you get this. Regardless of your age, regardless of your stage, regardless of your background, regardless of what you call qualifications, God is still calling you. God doesn't repent of his call. There's somebody in here who is rehearsing their, their inconsistencies and their inadequacies. And God is saying, I don't care about your inconsistencies. I don't care about your inadequacies. Watch this. I accept you as you are because I know where I'm taking you. So let me help you get this. God has called all of us to salvation. He has called all of us to sanctification. He has called all of us to service in his kingdom in whatever gifting and capacity that we have. And God says, even if you feel inadequate at this time, over time, I'm going to perfect that which concerns you. I'm going to make you better at what it is that you do. So just accept the call. The second thing, the second thing is appropriation. You have qualification and then you have appropriation. 
Let me say this. Here's the anchor statement. Do not take what isn't yours and place it where it doesn't belong. Let me, let, me, let me say it again. Do not take what isn't yours and place it where it doesn't belong. To give you a little bit of history and uh, politics, they have what they call appropriations meetings in Congress. And their appropriations meetings, right, argued by progressives, conservatives, Democrats, Republicans, what they're arguing about is money. Watch this. Money that's not theirs. They're taking what doesn't belong to them and they're appropriating it to what it doesn't belong in. And so what they have, because they can't agree, right? And you've heard people talking about, oh, they're gonna shut down the government. Anybody ever hear that before? Yeah. So what they do is they pass what they call a continuing resolution. That continuing resolution is, hey, we don't agree. We're still gonna fund these things and we're just gonna kind of kick the can down the road and deal with all the other things. Right, so you have people who will use right, the argument of what need, what, where the need is financially and why they won't approve the, the, the appropriations bill. Right? So right, you have conservatives saying, let's build the wall. Spend the money and build the wall. And you have some saying, let's fix the economy. Spend the money to bring down the price of goods. And they say, well, nope. I'm not going to sign the bill because if it, fix in, it fixes inflation, then it's going to be a win for your side. No, I'm not going to sign the bill because if we fix the wall, it's going to be a win for your side. And so now they have this conflict and they take what is not theirs and they apply it to things that it doesn't belong to. Get it? Appropriation is not just applying it. Now watch this. They make sure those things that they're arguing about don't get funded, but guess what? They still get paid. Their ap appropriation is when you take something that's not yours and you take ownership of it. You say, well, where is that in the text? Jeremiah is dealing with a battlefront, not only on the outer life, he's dealing with a struggle in the inner life. And let me help you understand that the same struggle he's dealing with is the same struggle that we're dealing with. And social media exacerbates this inner struggle. He's dealing with anxiety and he's dealing with insecurity. He's dealing with anxiety. Notice God says, don't be afraid of the face of the people. Anxiety, now let me be a counselor, right? As pastors, we're, we're, we're financiers, we're, we're real estate agents, we're, we're insurance agents, we're counselors, we're therapists. And so, so, so let me help you understand, anxiety is always tied to a negative outcome. You are never going to have a good outcome and be anxious about it. You'll be impatient about it, but you won't be anxious about it. If I was to tell you, hey, I'm going to give you $1,000 at the end of service, you would be like, okay, hurry up, finish preaching so that you can give me $1,000 at the end of service. But if I was to use fear on the outer life, that would be a driver to, to control behavior. And so what happens is they use fear. They're going to, the, the, the migrants are going to take over the, 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 the guns in the city. And what it does is it controls human behavior. So what God is doing before he sends Jeremiah out, he has to deal with what's within. And Jeremiah doesn't need to be afflicted or conflicted with what is going on in the outside world. He needs to be able to preach the unadulterated word of God and not be aware or concerned about the response it's going to bring from the people. And so there's anxiety. We deal with it. We worried about the economy. But I thought Je God was Jehovah Jireh. We worried about sickness. People still scared of COVID. I thought he was Jehovah Rapha. Now, I'm not saying don't use wisdom, but I'm saying there should be no fear. We're worried about who's going to be the next president. But my Bible says that God is king over kings and Lord over lords the Alpha and the Omega. My Bible says that the heart of the king is in the hand of the Lord, and as a river, God directs it whithersoever he pleases. My Bible says that it's God who sits upon the circle of the earth. He calls to heavens his throne and the earth his footstool. My Bible says that it is God who establishes kings and pulls down kingdoms. My Bible says that some trust in chariots and some in horses, but we will remember the name of the Lord our God. So it should matter who's going to be the president as long as God is on the throne. 
But we use fear to control human behavior. Here's the second thing that we face. Not only anxiety, but insecurity. Notice what Jeremiah says. He says, I'm a child. Social media exacerbates this. Here's what, here's what the, 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 the overwhelming messaging of the world says. You're not pretty enough. You're not tall enough. You're not fast enough. You're not rich enough. You're not skinny enough. Big girl season, you're not fat enough. You don't dress the part. You don't look the part. You don't smell the part. You don't sound the part. Your skin color is too melanated. Your skin color isn't melanated enough. You don't know culture. You are too cultured. We live in a world that hones in on insecurity. So watch this. Insecurity, just like fear drives behavior, insecurity does too. The nation of Israel, because they are insecure in who they are and who God called them to be, you and I, when we face insecurity, what we do is we go and get things that we think are going to make us feel better about ourselves, right? We go get the lace front, we go get the Jordan t- the sneakers, we go get the Timberlands, we go get the long nails where I don't even know how you scratch your hand or do anything else with. We go, we go and get the Louis Vuitton, we go and get all kind of stuff because we want to feel good about ourselves. And what happens is that thing that gives you value becomes your God. You say, how do you know it becomes my God? Because of the way we respond when someone takes it from you. You won't take my president. That's my president. You, 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 won't, you won't take my favorite singer. You won't take my, my, my musicians. You won't take my hip-hop and R&B record mom and dad. You won't take my wardrobe. You won't take my stuff. And what happens is the thing, watch this, here's how sin works. Sin lets you think that you control it in order to ultimately control you. Now watch this. The appropriation is, watch this, we all have fear. Say it to your neighbor. Say, neighbor, neighbor. you scared. Watch this. <laughs> you say, what about the song that says, I ain't never scared. Why? I ain't never scared. Yeah. Right? You take that person and you put them in a maximum security penitentiary, and they're going to be scared. <laughs> when the police, whoop, whoop, they, oh, oh, I thought you were never scared. <laughs> right? The reality is it is, an, it, is the, it is the outflowing of the sin nature that we all have. If you go back to the Garden of Eden, Adam and Eve commit sin, and immediately the Bible says that they begin to they become afraid. And God says, what, why did you cover, what, where did this fear come from? It's why later in the book of Timothy, the Bible says, For God hath not given us the spirit of fear, but of power and of love and of a sound mind. Because fear is an out, it's, an, it's a construct, it's an outworking of the sin nature in our life. We all have fear. And what we must do with our fear is not put the thing we fear at the center of our life. We must put the God who is on the throne at the center of our life. This is why Jesus said, don't be afraid of man who can kill the body. Fear God who can destroy the soul. So God is dealing with Jeremiah and he's dealing with you to drive your fear, your anxiety, your insecurity out of your life. Watch this. We all have insecurities. We all have what Jacob had. We have a slight limp. And what we don't want is people to see our limp. We have our own proclivities, our struggles, our issues. And what God says is the insecurity in your life is not going to be fixed by taking external things and bringing them into your life. It's going to be fixed by t- going inwardly first and hearing that you are blessed and highly favored. Hearing that you are above and not beneath. Hearing that you are the apple of the eye of God. Hearing that, yes, 
David, your father views you as the least significant, but I see you as a man after my own heart. Yes, Gideon, you feel like a coward, but I see you as a mighty man. Yes, Rahab, you feel like a harlot who has committed iniquity, but I see you as a deliverer of a nation. I see you in the lineage of my dear son. Yes, you have gone through hurts and pains, some self-inflicted and, uh, and some others inflicted. But what it does is it causes an insecurity that God has to drive out of us in order to get us to do what he has called us to do. You don't have to be pretty. You don't have to be skinny. You don't have to be ugly. You don't have to be heavy. You don't have to be black. You don't have to be white. You don't have to be young. You don't have to be old. God can still use you. Some of us have checkered pasts. Some of our checkered pasts are worse than the other person's checkered past. But the Bible says, the Apostle Paul said, and such were some of you, but now are ye washed. <laughs> the things I used to do, I don't do anymore. The things I used to be, I'm not anymore. God changes the people he calls. And here's the last thing, and then we're going to go home. Your qualification of appropriation, and lastly, your salvation. Okay. Watch this. Here's the anchor phrase. Come to the city of refuge, or the city of refuge will come to you. Um, so so, so let, me, let, me, let me build this. Jeremiah is from a city called Anathoth. Anathoth is what is called is referred to as a city of refuge. If you go into the books of Deuteronomy and the book of Joshua, God establishes what he calls cities of refuge. And here's what they are. If you committed involuntary manslaughter, right, not murder, but if by some accident you took someone's life, imagine you get into a car accident and that person dies. That's involuntary manslaughter, right? If you committed involuntary manslaughter, if you got to the city of refuge, the person who had the, 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 the right to avenge the life that you took, they couldn't take your life. It was a safe haven. It's what we call today sanctuary cities, right? If you get here, ain't nobody going to deport you. If you get here, we're going to take care of you, right? The city of refuge was established for these instances. And as long as the priest that presided over the city was alive, the person who was inhabiting the city, you had to stay there. If you left, the revenger could get you. You had to stay in the city, and as long as you stayed in the city, you were safe. And that, that, that charge would be dismissed once that priest died. Watch this. You're going to like this. Jesus is the city of refuge. Yes, you and I committed a trespass, and the person we offended, God, and the person we hurt, man, is out for blood. But if you get to the city of refuge... You are, as they say in baseball, safe. Watch this, watch this. You're going to like this even more. You had the responsibility prior to Jesus to get to the city. In the New Testament, the city of refuge comes to you. You say, prove it in the text. Jeremiah is from a city of refuge. His father is the priest of the city. And God calls him to send him to the nation of Israel to bring the city of refuge to them. 
So watch this. In the city of refuge, God is the mayor. He's the city councilman. He's the lawyer, the city attorney. In the city of refuge, God is the baker. He's the butcher. He's the farmer. And he's the grocer. He's the provider. In the city of refuge, God is the great physician. He's the doctor. He's the lawyer. He's the way maker. He's the miracle worker. He's the promise keeper. He's the light in the darkness. In the city of refuge, he's the king. He is the, the working class. In the city of refuge, he is the redeemer. In the city of refuge, he is the one who gives life to the dead. In the city of refuge, he is seated on the throne. And so what God has called you and I to do is to be ambassadors, to go out into the city of Palm Bay, to go out into the neighborhood, and to bring the city of refuge to them. Hallelujah. 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 God, you're worthy. Hallelujah. Hallelujah. Father, we bless you. Father, we bless you. Father, we bless you. You see, you don't have to qualify to get into the city of refuge. All you got to do is accept the invitation. And the moment that you accept the invitation, you become an inhabitant, a resident of the city of refuge. And when you get in the city of refuge, God assures your calling. God helps you discover it, develop it, and deploy it. God invites you into the city. And what happens is when you encounter the butcher or the baker, the grocer or the farmer who has provided for you, you tell the world by testimony that there's a Jehovah Jireh in your city who provided for you. When you were sick in your body and God raised you up, he was the great physician. He was the one who had the balm of Gilead. He was the one who restored you. And when he does, you go out into the world and you tell them that in my city, I have a great physician who cures the common cold and cures things as complex as cancer. When God restored your marriage, you, when God showed you that he was the advocate, that he was the counselor, that he was the therapist, that he was the one who affects the hearts of men and women, when he turned it around, when God brought the prodigal son back home, when God restored your, your strength in the midst of the years, when God raised you up, watch this, and watch this, not only do people say, well, wait, 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 there's a whole bunch of providers, there's a whole bunch of doctors, there's a whole bunch of healers, there's a whole bunch of lawyers, there's a whole bunch of way makers, there's a whole bunch of people who can do uh, uh, miracles and all this other stuff, signs and wonders, but watch this, here's the one thing, just like when, when, when Phineas and Hopni in, in Egypt, they said, hey, Pharaoh, we can't keep up with Moses, he's doing stuff that we can't do. Watch this, what God does is he says, yeah, they can do all of that stuff, but none of them can take a Lazarus who is three days dead and raise them up from the grave. None of them can lay down their life and die on a cross for the sins of the world and then three days later decide that they're going to pick that life back up, that they're going to overcome death, hell, and the grave, and they're going to come walking out of that tomb. None of them can pass into the heavenlies, the Bible says, for we have not a high priest which cannot be touched with the feeling of our infirmities, but was likewise tempted in all parts just as we are yet without sin. We have a high priest who is the priest, watch this, who resides over the city of refuge, and he died. And when he died, the ordinances that were against you were wiped away, but he didn't stay dead. He got up from the grave, and he is the great high priest who still reigns over the city. And as long as he is alive, you and I are Woo! Hallelujah. 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 Glory to God. Hallelujah. He is the great high priest. And we are saved. <laughs> so it don't matter who's on the throne. It don't matter who's in the White House. It don't matter who's the banker. It don't matter who's the real estate agent. It don't matter who's the coroner or the mortician. God is on the throne. Yes. And 
He is alive. And we are You see, it's in the city of refuge that justice, what we deserved, God shows us mercy. And it's in the city of refuge that judgment, God takes his wrath out on his self instead of taking it out on you. So parents, elders, we ought to empower our children to answer the call of God and we ought to be the first example in our house of those who answer the call of God despite our insecurities, despite our, uh, our anxieties, we should still heed the call of God and we should be the ambassadors of the city of refuge. I don't know about you, but I want to go to Anathoth. Anybody want to go to Anathoth? Anybody want to see where Jeremiah was from? Heads are bowed. Eyes are closed. Did you get anything out of the word? Amen. Woo! City of refuge. Hallelujah.